Jason Michael is on thank you guys I mean thank you So, <laughs> I unfortunately have to revert back to English. You know, you don't realize eh, how it's, it's not, it doesn't come natural to preach in English. Um, but uh, we thank God that thus far uh, he, has, he has carried us nonetheless. Was it? So, uh, I will revert back to the English from King George, as well. Amen. Amen. Uh, let's continue, as well, with, uh, with the subject that we started with, as well, last week. Um, and if you remember last week, as well, um, there were a few things um, that we mentioned about the mercy of God. Um, and I want to pick up on some of those things so that we can continue today, Razan. I want us to go to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. Uh, when you have found it, please read for us. And go. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Continue. First Corinthians chapter one, verse three. Is that, is that all it says? Okay, just read it again. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And the next verse. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God. Sorry, man. Second Corinthians. That's why. Second Corinthians. Sorry. Let's go there. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, mm. the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Hallelujah. I don't think we can hear you. Eh? Please read out loud. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. This verse describes God as the Father of what was earth. He's the father of what? Mercy. He's the father of mercy. Amen. Now, what does that mean to you? When, when, when the Bible says God is the father of mercy, that means everything that has to do with mercy originates from him. When you are the father of something, when you father something, it means that thing that you, that you want to call whatever it is. If that person is the father of it, it means he's the originator. Just like it says, the devil is the father of all lies. So all lies, their source is the devil. All mercy that you find, wherever you are, the source of all mercy is God. So it means every time you are walking in mercy, you can't lay claim and say, I'm merciful on my own. No, no. He is the father of mercy. He's the source of all mercy. Because all mercy proceeds out of him, and then last week we saw the mercy of God being at play. We saw the man of faith Abraham lying about his wife, saying, "No, my wife is not my wife; she's my sister." He lied about it, never said. And the mercy of God covered him in his lies, You remember that the mercy of God went to King Abimelech and said to Abimelech, "Watch out." The person that, the, this wife, this woman that you have in your court belongs to another husband. You are a dead man if you don't release this wife. Remember, it's God leaving heaven for a man who has lied. Because God, but the Bible says, it is because of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Because his compassions fail not. And then he says they are new every morning. Great is his, is his faithfulness. Yeah. And I want to repeat this. Sometimes when the challenges of life haven't come and dealt with you properly. I don't know how to say it in English. You sometimes don't appreciate the mercy of God. 
People who've been through life and who have been hurt and who have been seriously chastised by life, they know something about the mercy of God. This man, a man of God who had lied, is able to taste, is able to benefit from the mess. And when God says they are new every morning, he knows that you will need them every morning. He knows that you will need them every day. So, Bazalana, there's a problem with relying on yourself instead of relying on the messes of God. And I'll try and explain this later as we go. Not only that, we saw Jesus last week when the Pharisees were demanding of him to pay temple tax and when they were accusing his disciples. His disciples, on a Sabbath, they went to a cornfield and they picked up food. And they said, don't you see that your disciples are breaking the law? And he said to them, you don't understand. The problem is you, you don't understand this scripture that says, God desires mercy and not sacrifice. You remember that, Basel? We explained what that scripture means. That scripture meant that, he said to them, don't you know that David, also with his men, went into the temple when they were hungry, and they ate food that was only set for the priests, and yet God did not punish them. You remember that, person? Yeah. And he said not only that, so he quoted another example where someone said, he said, because you are only concerned about people bringing sacrifices to the church so that you can eat, because when there are sacrifices, the priests will eat. He said, that's all you are interested in, but I, as the Lord, desire mercy, not sacrifice. So he was saying, mercy for me is more important than the law. Are you with me, Basel? Mm -hmm. I am more merciful to you than I'm more interested in instituting the law. That, that's the one that we saw, Basel. Now, I asked a question last week, which I, I, want to, I want to go back there again, because... I somehow felt maybe we did not get this thing as well as I wanted us to get. Remember I asked the question last week. I asked the question, what makes sin, sin? You remember that question, man? Or don't you remember it? Yeah, well then, I don't remember. Were you here or were you not here? <laughs> I asked the question, what makes sin, sin? Remember what we are talking about, mess. And God has mercy on whomever he wants to have mercy. Never said. But you have, to, you have to understand. Okay, let's go back a step. What kind of a person needs mercy? It's someone who's done wrong, isn't it? You only need mercy because you've done something wrong. Is that not the case? What makes that thing wrong? What makes that thing sin? Or what makes it not to be sin? It's God, isn't it? God decides what is sin and he decides what he decides what is not sin. Do you accept that, Basel? Mm -hmm. It is God who makes a call whether an act is sin or not. If God decides what he, um, eating an apple is a sin, it becomes a sin. Whether you think it's not a sin or you think it's a sin, he's the one that makes a decision about what sin is. Are we all together, Basel? Mm -hmm. Now, Here's, here's the thing. As human beings, we sometimes have a problem. Uh, even when things go wrong in the world, we even accuse God of being wrong. Do you understand me, Basel? We say God is wrong in doing this and this and this, meaning we make God to be a sinner, and yet we don't understand. He is the only one who can decide what sin is. Let me try and explain this a little bit better, maybe with examples, so that you will understand what I'm trying to say. Go to the book of Psalms 24, verse 1. By the way you are looking at me, I'm seeing not even one of you is nodding. So maybe you don't understand what I'm saying. Let me try and explain it further. Psalms chapter 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and all those who dwell therein. Let's read it step by step. Read again. The earth is the Lord's. The earth. This place, what that we call home. The earth. Who does it belong to? Lord. It's the Lord's. Not only the earth, but what else? And all its fullness. And all its fullness. What happens to that? 
the world and all those who dwell therein. The world and all those who dwell in Tuat, they all belong to who? To the Lord. What does that mean, my son? If all of this thing belongs to the Lord, it means he alone has the right to decide how this thing works. It's his. What that means is you and me, in the truest sense, we don't own anything. Because remember, even your own body, you can't just do what you want with your own body. Because if you do what you want, you are accountable to someone else. Because by right, this body is not yours. It belongs to him. Amen. Are you with me, Master? Mm -hmm. The world, the fullness thereof, and all those who dwell in it belong to the Lord. And therefore, it is the Lord that's got the right to decide what happens with this thing. He decides what happens with your body. He decides what happens to the world. He decides what happens to, the, to everything because it's his. He gets the right to decide because everything belongs to him. Are you with me, Bazaar? Amen. We are together. Amen. So the Lord makes a decision. Here's something which you might think is wrong in your mind, but the Lord makes a decision. So in the Old Testament, when people sinned, the Lord says to them, You have my have sinned. You are the one that's done something that is wrong. But he says, because I am God, I make a choice that you can go kill an animal for the atonement of your sins. Now, in my own human being, and if I was a, an environmentalist and I was one of these green people, I would say that's wrong. Are you with me, Bazaar? How is it right that I kill I make a sin or I kill someone and then in order to cover my sin I must kill an innocent animal. Do you understand the brother? Yeah. It's because the, the world and all that dwell in them belong to the Lord. So the Lord has got a right to decide what happens with these things. So in my mind it may sound wrong that if I have done something wrong I have to bring a goat or I have to bring a sheep or I have to bring a pigeon so that blood is spilled so that my sins can be covered. It sounds wrong, is that, is that not Baza? But God is the one that decides. Because everything belongs to him. I'll give you another example of the fact that it is God who decides what sin is. One time, the, one, the same act, he says it's a sin, and another time he says it's fine, you can do it. Do you believe that, Baza? He, he is God. He, con he controls everything. Let, let me tell you, let me just give you a few examples. So, in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verse 13, and Deuteronomy, chapter 5, verse 17, don't go there. That is where he gives the children of Israel the Ten Commandments. One of the commandments there, in these two verses, it says, thou shalt not kill. Are you that? It says, thou shalt not kill, and specifically, it's talking about human beings. Thou shalt not murder a human being. That's a law. Are you with me, Bazaar? Mm -hmm. If you do this thing, you are in violation of the law of God. If you murder someone else. Are you with me, Bazaar? Mm -hmm. But look at God. Because he's the one that makes a decision. In the book of First Samuel, chapter 15, verse 3. Go there. We need to read that one. First Samuel, chapter 15, verse 3. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all they have and do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. <laughs> What's that? Is this the same God that just says, do not kill? The one that gave the law that it is wrong to murder. He is the same one that is telling a man who he has appointed as king over his nation. He says, I want you to go and kill Amalek. And he says, don't just kill Amalek. Kill men, women, children, animals, everything. You know why? Because he's God. This is his thing. He is the one that decides what sin is. So, but I'm, I'm telling, what I'm trying to tell you is, 
When God decides to kill, it's not a sin. It's not a sin. When he says to kill is a sin, it becomes a sin because he's God like that. Amen. Are you with me, brother? Amen. He is God. He owns this thing. And I know you're probably thinking this is not fair. But it's his. Amen. It's his things. It's his world. He decides. Let, let's go to... Remember, brother, I, I quoted the, in the book of Matthew last week where Jesus was saying, when they were asking him about temple tax, why did you not pay tax? And then he asked them a question. He said, the kings of this world, who do they charge tax to? Do they charge tax to their sons or to their, to their, to their subjects? And they said, no, charge is tax to their subjects. So what I, was, what I was explaining last week, even though it's the law of the land that every citizen pays tax, but the king can decide who he doesn't want to pay tax. Because oh, he's the king, I mean, that's why I referred you to Saul again in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 17 where he said whoever kills Goliath will be exempt from tax. Because when you own, you can decide what happens with people. Certain laws that apply to other people, you can decide they don't apply to others. He is God like that. And you need to make peace with the fact that he is God. So, Bazan, I'm, I'm, I'm repeating to you. It is God who decides what sin is. Are you with me, Bazan? He is the, it's not the act itself. You can do something which all of us think is a sin. And God says, no, today I pronounce it's not a sin. <laughs> because he, he's got that power. He's got that. It's his, Baza. It's his. That is why one day all, some of us are going to be shocked when we get to the other side. And who we find on the other side. We will be surprised. How did this one get in here? The God of mercy decided. In his mercy and his loving kindness, he made a decision. You judge them with your own eyes. You never know, Basa. He is God like that, Basa. Hallelujah. Let me give you further examples. I want to cement this thing. In the book of Romans chapter 14, verse 23, here is something that you would maybe have not even thought that is a sin. It's in the New Testament. In your mind, you might not have thought, because when you think of sin, you think of lies, you think of stealing, you think of murder, you think of all these things. But here's what God says sin is. 14.23 Romans. But he, who, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he does not eat from faith, for whatever is not from faith is sin. Whatever is done out of faith, it's a sin. So even if you are doing the right act, the right act, you are doing the right works, let's call my own savings now. You are doing the right work, but you are not doing it in faith. It's still sin. But it is God who decides what sin is. We don't make up our minds about what sin is and what is not. And unfortunately, the world wants to be philosophical about sin. They want to tell you how can uh, God do this? How it, it is he who decides. And you need to make up your mind, is he God or not? If he's not God, he can't make up his mind. But if he is God, he's got every right to decide how he wants this thing to work. Are you with me, Master? And one of those things which are hidden, he says, if you do anything, no matter how good that deed is, if it's not done in faith, it's a sin because he's the one who decides. I'm saying one day something is sin, one day when the Lord decides because he's God like that. Amen. Let me give you another example. In the book of Acts chapter 10. Go there. Acts chapter 10. The reason I'm saying all of this is I want you to understand the mercy of God. That when he decides to be merciful, Amen. he can decide to be merciful to you even when you have done wrong. Because he owns this thing. It's his deal. It's not our deal. Acts chapter 10. From verse 9. Read it The next day as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the house step to pray about the sixth hour. Mm. Until verse 15. 16. Go. Carry on. 
Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven open and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners, descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things and birds of the air. And a voice came to Peter, and a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Yes. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, What God has cleansed you must not call common. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. This act, the Bible says, was done three times. It's a vision, Mazara. It's a sheet coming down from heaven, held on its four corners. And it's got all manner of unclean animals. And how do we know they're unclean? Because God told them in the law what kind of animals you must eat and what kind of animals you mustn't eat. So God did a whole thing in the Old Testament. We explained to them. You must only eat fish with scales. Uh, you mustn't eat animals like, you know, so things like the, uh, the rat and the rabbit, you mustn't eat. Things like the lizard. And he, he, he mentioned all of these things, these creeping things. He said you must not eat, you know. Um, so that was given in the law. So he brings this thing that is filled with unclean food. And he says, kill and eat. And Peter says, no, no, from a young man, as a young man, I've never eaten anything unclean. And what's God's response? Don't call that which I've said is clean, unclean. Are you with me, brother? So today, the Lord, the Lord has decided, this food is clean today. Because this thing is his deal, he decides how, it says it happened three times, brother. And what he was trying to show him, he was giving him a vision. Remember, the children of Israel were not even supposed to eat with the Gentiles. And he was saying, today I've made the Gentiles clean. I'm calling them to myself. So don't you not fellowship with the Gentiles. Because this is something I, the Lord, have decided. The world and all that dwell therein belong to the Lord. Are you with me, Mazar? So it is God who decides what sin is. Are you understanding me now what I'm trying to say? It's not us, it is him. If he decides wearing a jacket in church is a sin, I'm sinning. So it's not the act that makes it a sin. It's what God decides is a sin. You can do anything nice and not do it out of faith. That is a sin. I you, mm -hmm. you can go and kill under the instruction of the Lord, even though He won't tell you in the New Testament. Because the Lord won't tell you to go kill in the New Testament. But I'm using an example in the Old Testament. We had given them the law. He tells his king to go and kill. And his king is not sinning by carrying out. In other words, he was carrying judgment on behalf of the Lord. Are you with me, Mazar? It is God who decides what sin is. I remember that. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about mercy. So when God decides to show mercy on people, sometimes God shows mercy to people that we think don't deserve mercy. Especially because they've done things to us. You know, let, let me just make an example. Someone, let me make a gruesome example. A man rapes you as a young lady, maybe. And then you are so angry with them because they took maybe your, your, your purity as a young lady. You are angry with them. And God has mercy on them. And he gives them the gift of salvation. It's, it's the Lord who decided to give them mercy. You can't be angry with the Lord because he's the one that decides. Bazaar. He gives mercy to whom he wants to give mercy. Go to the book of Romans chapter 9. Verse 14 to verse 15. <laughs> it's not nice, isn't it? But when that mercy comes to you, then you will appreciate it. It's not nice when it goes to someone else, but when it comes to you, 
then you will appreciate it. Romans chapter 9, verse 14 to 15. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy. Yes. And I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. Mm -hmm. He decides who he has mercy on and he decides who he has compassion on because he is God like that. Bazalai. The reason why I mention all of this Bazalai, is because in Christ the mercy, the grace and the love of God is fulfilled. Are you with me Bazalai? In Christ, the mercy, the grace, and love of God is fulfilled. So therefore, what I'm trying to say, we mustn't try to reinvent the wheel. God has already decided how this thing works. It doesn't help you to try and redefine it. God has already decided this is how things work, Bazalwa. Hallelujah. Now, the main thing, Bazalwa, I want us to discuss today, or the main focus of my sermon, is this whole idea that we sometimes depend too much on ourselves and not enough on the mercy of God. We demand too much on our works and our ability to do things and not so much on the mercy of God. And the mercy of God is available, but it's available for all of those who are aware of it and for those who are seeking for the mercy of God. I want to show you the danger of depending on your works in the kingdom that we are in, Bazalai. Hallelujah. Amen. I want to go back to the verse that God read for us this morning. The book of Nahum, chapter 1, verse 7. The verse that we read at intercession. It's always better when you've got a, a, a phone, because if you had a Bible, I think I'd have to give you five minutes before you find now. Yeah. So, <laughs> it's much better. Um, have you found it now? Chapter 1, verse 7. Read it for us. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who trust in him. Bazana, do you hear that last, the last part of that verse? It says, he knows those who trust in him. Not those who trust in their works, not those who trust in their own righteousness, not those who trust in their resources, not those who trust in their abilities, but those who trust in Him. So, when, just read that verse again, though. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. Yes. A stronghold in the day of trouble. And He's a stronghold in the day of trouble. But not just for everyone. He's not a stronghold just for everyone. Because what? Because he knows those who trust in him. So those who lean on him. You know when you trust in him, you are leaning on him. You are not leaning on yourself. You are not leaning on your own strength. You are not leaning on your own righteousness. You are not leaning on your own power. But you are leaning on him. So you know that in your own self, in your own strength, without the Holy Spirit, Without God working in you, you are a doomed person. Without the mercy of God, you are a doomed person. You see, I've seen Abba Zalwani in my walk. I've seen Abba Zalwani who depend on himself. Usually when they fall, they fall hard. Because they've placed too much dependence on themselves. And the condemnation and guilt that goes when they've fallen is so huge that the devil pre prevents them from doing anything else. You know why? Because they feel they have failed God more than that. Mm. Because they are fully dependent on themselves. Mm. I want to talk about the dangers of depending on yourself. And I want us to read in the book of John, um, the Gospel of John, chapter 13. This is Bazalani when uh, Jesus was having the Last Supper with his disciples. I'm talking about the dangers. Of depending on yourself and not depending on the mercy and the grace of God. John chapter 13, verse 1. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, 
that he should depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Bazaar, this is now before the feast of the Passover. So this was just before the feast of the Passover. You remember, which a Passover was a meal that the Lord said they must, the Israelites must do in remembrance of how he took them out of Egypt. So every time they were having Passover, it was a reminder of how God took them out with a strong and mighty hand out of Egypt. Do you remember what I Now, this, what is happening here is a fulfillment. So what happened in Egypt was a type of what Christ will fulfill. Now, what I want you to remember, Bazan, I, I spoke about this on Tuesday when we were having the cell meeting. The children of Israel, the Bible tells us there were about one point something million that left Egypt. The Bible said, God said to them, sacrifice a lamb and take what from the lamb? The blood of the lamb. And do what with the blood? Put it on the doorposts. So that when the angel of death comes, he will pass over that house. So, remember, what is the angel of death coming to do? It's coming to kill. Are you with me, Bazaar? What prevents the angel of death from killing the children of Israel? It is the blood, Bazaar. Now, you need to understand this. They were saved not because of their works, but they were saved because of the blood. Are you with me, Bazaar? Mm -hmm. When the angel saw the blood, the blood represents washing. The blood represents cleanliness. Regard, remember, Bazaar, you may find that out of those one point something million Israelites, one of them, that very day, maybe they stole from someone else. That very same day, they might have lied to someone else, and yet the blood covers everything. Are you with me, Bazaar? The blood covers everything. They haven't done anything. What covers them is the blood. And I'm talking about this thing of depending too much on ourselves and not so much on the mercy and the goodness of God. They were all saved because of the blood, not because of what they did. Are you with me? It was even worse. It doesn't even say that they went and they confessed their sins to God. No, it doesn't even appear there. And yet the blood covered all of them. And the Bible says when they left Egypt, not even one of them was feeble because of this Passover meal. So this is what is happening now in John is the fulfillment of that type. Are you with me, Bazaar? Mm -hmm. Now here are a few things. I want us to know there are two disciples I want us to focus on. I want us to focus on Peter and I want us to focus on John. Because these two represent two types of Christians. Amen. Are you with me, Mazar? Mm -hmm. They represent two types of Christians. Are we together, Mazar? Amen. All right, let's go. Chapter, the same chapter, verse 5 to verse 8. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am, what I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Wow. Wow. Do you hear that, Bazaar? Mm -hmm. It's after the supper, after they've had the supper, Jesus takes a towel and he starts washing the disciples' feet. This is a symbol, Bazaar. He's, he's washing the disciples' feet. When you wash something, what is the intention of washing? To make it clean. Yeah, Bazaar? Mm -hmm. So who washes them? It's Christ who washes them. And Peter says, you know, check. You know I do not chase. He says never. You will never 
Or in fact, he says, Lord, I want to wash my feet. And he says, you know what, Peter, you don't understand what I'm doing. But after this, you will understand. Never said. He says, after this whole thing is said and done, you will understand why it is important. And Peter says, no, you will not wash my feet. And Jesus says, if I don't wash your feet, what will happen? You have no part with me. In other words, Peter is, is a type, he, he represents, Peter represents the law. He represents the type of Christian that wants to do things and he doesn't want things to be done for them. Are you with me, Mazak? Remember the word Peter, what does it mean? It means rock. So it's a type of a law, Bazala. And he's the one that says, I must do things, Lord. You mustn't do anything. Are you with me, Bazala? So the, he is that type of a umzanonjad. And we still have those types of Christians who are so reliant on themselves. They believe that they, they need to do things so that they can save themselves. If they don't do it, then they are not going to heaven. Are you with me, Bazala? 100% dependent on themselves. If I don't do this, if I don't do this. That's, that's a Peter type of a Christian. Are you with me, Bazar? And I'm not saying there aren't works that we mustn't. There are things we must do, Bazar. There are things which the Lord has called us to do. And I will get to that. But Peter is that kind of a Are you with me, Bazar? He doesn't want Christ to do anything for him. Instead, he wants to do for Christ. And Christ says, if I don't wash your feet, if I don't make you clean, you have no part with me. In other words, he's saying, I've only got a part with those who allow me to wash them. Are you with me, Bazar? And then there's another kind of Mzalwani here. His name is John. In the same book, chapter 23, what does it say about John? Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Now, the, you know who, who the, the disciple whom Jesus loved? You know who that one is? Do you know what's that? Can I show my nazi so that I can tell you what's that? Do you know what's <laughs> that? If you don't know, just say. The disciple who always calls himself the one Jesus loved, do you know which one that is? It's John. And it's interesting. He's the one that wrote this book. And he's got the audacity to say, I am the one that, that the Lord loved. You see, what that he, John was leaning more on the love of Jesus more than he leaned on his own strength. Are you with me, Bazaar? Even the fact that he is laying on the bosom of Christ is, a, is symbolic of his dependence. You know, when, when something goes wrong and when your child is in trouble and when they come, they want to lie on your bosom, it shows that they are, dependent, they are depending on you. They are showing that they need you. He is lying on the bosom of Christ to show his dependence on the Lord. Let me tell you what happens to these two brethren before this thing is over and done with. In a couple of hours, this one that said, you will not wash my feet. Never. You will not wash my feet. I am the one who must do things for you. Before the cock crowed, he had denied Christ three times. He had run away, Bazalan. He had been, he was in hiding because he depended too much on himself and what he can do. And the one who was lying on the bosom of Christ, who depended on Christ, when Christ is being crucified in chapter 19, I think it's verse, he is there at the cross, at the feet of Christ. Are you with me, Bazar? Mm -hmm. Because when you depend on him, Bazar, even when life comes and hits you, you will always remain with him. But when you depend upon yourself, your strength will fail one of these days. Mm -hmm. These are the two types of Christians. The one that depends on God and the one that depends on themselves. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. One ends up, the one who depends on himself, the one who's outspoken about sin, the one who's outspoken about all these things is the one that we find running away. 
because he's condemned. You see, the problem is he felt condemnation. He felt guilt because he was depending on himself. John, the one who depended on his lap, was with him until the end. At the cross, when the, the, the soldiers were killing him, he was there. In fact, read the verse in the, in the same book, in the same chapter, 1926, John. And then we'll wrap this thing up. Pastor. John chapter 19, verse 26. found it. John chapter 19 verse 26. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved mm. standing by, he said to his mother, woman behold your son. Mm. So Jesus is at the cross. He's about to die. He sees his mother there. Where is Peter? Nowhere to be found. The one who relies on himself is nowhere to be found. But the one who depends on Christ is there with him until his very last hour. You see, Bazalone, I'll, I'll emphasize this. You know, one of the things I fight for every day in my life, I fight for holiness. I fight to remain pure. I fight to remain holy. Because I know that is the standard. Are you with me, Bazalone? Amen. In everything I do, at work, with relationships, how I talk to people, I try and maintain holiness because I understand the importance of holiness. Never said, to be pure because we represent the gospel. But if I rely entirely on myself for my righteousness, I want to guarantee you I will fail one day. There's no ifs or I will. But if I rely on the mercy of God, if I, lay, if I rely on righteousness by faith, then I'm guaranteed eternal life. I don't know why sometimes we struggle with this thing. God has decided this is how this thing works. There's a righteousness that comes from faith. Don't try and fight it. He is God. That's how he has decided this thing is going to work. You know, when you read, I know that we have a challenge. And it's good, it's good that we must fight to stay righteous and to stay holy. That's what God wants from us. But remember what I said. If you could do everything to be holy. Remember, the Bible says, be holy as your father is holy. Now, some, someone that sins from time to time, do they qualify to be holy? Do you qualify? If you sin from time to time, Something that is holy, something that is pure, that is without a blemish. And that's the standard, Brother. And I'm telling you now, the only way you reach that standard is if Christ washes you. Amen. Not if you wash yourself with your own works. And I'm saying that's how God decided, because this is his deal, this is his thing. The thing that will usher us into pure righteousness is the precious blood of the Lamb when we accept it by faith. So I don't know why we sometimes struggle to accept this thing, that God has done it for us. So let's go um, to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Remember, Bazaran, some of us struggle with the concept of how can I be made right when I haven't done right? Is that not the case, Bazaran? We struggle with that concept. How can I be made right by faith when I haven't done right? Bazaar, it's not works that will get you into the kingdom of God. It is faith that gets you into the kingdom of God. Remember on Tuesday, I mentioned the sinner who was next to the Jesus on the cross? You remember? One was condemning him. One believed that Jesus Christ came from God. is the son of God. And he said, today you... You'll be with me in paradise. How many good deeds had that man had a chance to do? Yeah. Not even one. And yet he was going into paradise. Because, Bazaran, if you depend on yourself, it's hard. But when you depend on him, it's easy. 
I want to ask you a question. Okay, read this verse first, and then I'll ask you a question. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He made him who knew no sin to be sin. Now let me ask you the question, Bazaar. How is it possible that someone who never knew sin became sin? How do you become a sinner? Jesus, he never knew what sin is. And yet, the Bible says he became sin. And you accept that. Ne? We accept that. And yet we have a problem accepting that us, we can become righteous without having done anything that is righteous. How can you accept the one and not accept the other? He made him who knew no sin. Because this is his thing, he owns this thing. He can decide how it works. So even though Jesus had never sinned, Bazar, he had never sinned once, and yet he became a sinner. How does that work? No, it works because the one who decides what sin is, has decided. I'm going to put this sin on him, even though he has not sinned. And those who have sinned are making a decision that they have not sinned. And then you refuse to accept that gift. You say, no, I want to fight for myself. I want to make myself righteous. He has done it for you. Can you accept that Jesus was made sin? Can you accept that he knew no sin? Then why can't you accept that you are made righteous? Before you even done one act. Let's go to the book of Romans. It's all, this is all part of the mercy of God. Start in the book of Romans chapter 10 verse 20. But Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. So the mercy of God goes and finds us, even when we do not ask for him, even when we do not seek for him. It's looking for us, the mercy of God. You see, it is nature and he enjoys being merciful, God. He wants those who will accept his mercy. Now, this whole concept of us, not, go to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 5. Verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So when, when Jesus Christ was coming to die here, he was coming to die for people who were like what? Who were sinners. In his righteousness, he came to die for people who are sinners. Now, because of what he did, something happens in verse 19. Verse 19, the last verse. Verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Read that verse again. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Can we read in different translation, brother? Maybe this thing will get in inside of us. I don't know if we read in different translation. So there's one man that sinned. His name is Adam. And through his one sin, through his one sin, all of us were made sinners. And we accept that. We accept that. But why do we have a problem accepting the other one? Because it says in the same breath, so also by one man's obedience, which is Christ, many will be made righteous. Why do we have a problem accepting the one and not the other? Go and see from the translation. What does it say, Basel? And he says, but my, 
When he says, Abaning by Wenzu Abalumle, it's those that will accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Those who refuse him can take part. But those who accept him, because of his act, one man's act of obedience, many, many will be made what was righteous. I think I'm going translation, and then we can wrap this thing up. And just as all people were made sinners as a result of one man's disobedience, of one man, mm. in the same way, they will, they will all be put right with God as a, as a result of one obedience of one man. Hallelujah, mm. It's the obedience of Christ that makes us right. This is how God has decided this thing works. It says now there is a new righteousness which comes from faith and not by works so that no man can boast. None of us can boast that Mina, I'm righteous in my, on my own. I've made it on my own. No, 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 no. I've said this on Tuesday. If you could, then you don't need Christ. I never said. Mm -hmm. This is why the Bible says the message of the gospel is foolishness for those who are perishing. Mm -hmm. And for us who are being saved, it is the power of God. 1 Corinthians 1 18. Mm -hmm. When the world hears about this, what kind of foolishness is this? That you can become righteous by faith. You don't have to. It's foolishness. Nonsense. Mm -hmm. They don't understand the power of the cross. That all you have to do is accept him. Bazani, this mercy calls for you to lay on his bosom. To depend on him. And not on yourself. And then Bazani, by doing that, I'm telling you, you are guaranteed. You fight. You know, I, I said when I was explaining Tuesday, I'm repeating a lot of what I said on the Tuesday set. You know, when, when you depend on him yeah. and the Holy Spirit fills you in, what starts to happen? Your love for him starts to grow mm -hmm. and you start to hate sin more. Mm -hmm. I with you, mm -hmm. The more you love him, the more you start to hate sin more. That is why we tell people, you know, people, when we, when we share the message of the gospel with them, they say, no, but I'm not ready. I'm still a sinner. We say, come as you are. Hallelujah. Just the way, come. Because we know, once the Holy Spirit is inside of you, He will start working inside of you. Hallelujah. He will start making you hate sin. And before you know it, after five, six, seven years, the things that you are struggling with, you no longer struggle with. Because He works in you. So this is the thing, Master. Don't depend on yourself. Depend on Him. And he will work in you to work according to his great pleasure. Have you ever said? Amen. Jesus has done it. When he said on the cross, it is finished. Indeed, it was finished. So the world thinks we are crazy. The, th the world thinks, they think we have, we have drunk something strong. And yet we understand the mercy and the grace of our Father. Amen. Let me tell you something. When you start to understand that you've got righteousness which comes from faith, you won't allow the devil to condemn you. So let me tell you one of the devil's strategies in closing. What the devil wants to try and do, he wants to try and whisper every day that you are a sinner. You don't qualify. How can you stand in front of people and sin when you know that you have lied, when you know that you have done this? And then he knows that you can't serve it. You can't serve the Lord with a clean conscience. But every time you fall into that condemnation, he wins. But every time you say, you know what, I'm leaning on the mercy of God. Even though I've fallen seven times, the righteous may fall seven times, but the Lord raises him up. You, that's what you lean on. You don't lean on your own works and your own ability. And you say, you know what, I'm free from sin. Even though I might still be walking in sin, I'm free from it and I'm overcoming it. And you have a boldness. You see, even when you pray for that sickness, when you are praying for that breakthrough, the devil comes and says, Ah, you know. You know what you did last week. How can you come and ask this of God? It's because he wants to condemn you. Amen. The Bible says there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Amen. There is none. Amen. But it's those who are leaning on Christ, except those who are, not those who are leaning on their own works. He has done it. 
It's a free gift. You take it, take it or leave it. But it's there for you to receive. Highly us. Let us bow our heads. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for your never ending mercy. We thank you for your compassion that saw us as sinners and saw fit to come down and leave heaven to come and be a sacrifice for us. Thank you, Lord, that the whole world and all its fullness belong to you and you have chosen to save us in this fashion. You have chosen to make Christ our sacrifice once and for all. You say there is no, therefore no other sacrifice that is required. We thank you, Father, that there are works that you've called us unto. We will learn what it is you want us to do and we'll continue in those works, but not for the saving of our souls, but for the glory of your name. Open our eyes and Kusiam, to see that Christ has done everything for us. Don't let the devil deceive us and condemn us anymore because of what we have done. But let the righteousness that comes from faith be the main deal. And as it continues to wash us, we will be able to speak like your great apostle Paul. We will say, even though our outward, outward man is perishing, but the inner man is being renewed every day. Make us new every day. Make us hate sin with our lives. Let us hate everything that has got anything to do with filth of the world in the renewing of our mind and working us into, into the likeness of Christ, into the full faith and perfection that comes from faith in Jesus Christ. Father God, walk with us and bless us as this new week starts. Let your goodness, your mercy, and your favor be upon us, knowing in our conscience that we have been made right by faith, not through anything that we can do for ourselves. Let us go there and preach the message of the gospel. Let us go there and preach this good news for the world that is dying and lost, so that you may be glorified. Father, we pray for all of this in the mighty and holy name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Amen.